Hello, my name is Brian Coughlin. I am the Research Officer for Inland Fisheries Ireland's National Barrier Programme. If any, at any point you want more information on the Anacotti programme, please see Inland Fisheries Ireland's fisheriesireland.ie Anacotti. And this web page will have more information on where we are in the project and some of the science behind it. So the Anacotti project is about delivering improved fish passage at the bottom of the Mulcair system at Anacotti. As you can hear, see here from this map, with A, B, and C, we have Anacotti, followed by the Crump Weir, which is underneath the M7 motorway, and C, Ballyclaw. The reason that Anacotti is of such interest is because with its mitigation, it'll open up a significant amount of the Mulcair catchment to anadromous fish the anadromous fish populations, such as sea lamprey and Atlantic salmon. And I'd like to say to thank the Mulcair Life Programme for mitigating for breaching the Ballyclaw crump weir during its, during its tenure. So in terms of fish migration in the Mulcair catchment, Anacotti really is the outstanding ticket to significantly increase the fish populations upstream of the structure. Here we can see a drone video of the structure as it is now. Um, as we zoom in here, in the Mulcair Life project, they added lamprey tiles to the face of the weir to increase lamprey passage. This worked for a number of years until they were eroded over time due to exposure to sunlight. So their eff effectiveness or their efficiency has now significantly decreased. In the center of the weir, there is a Deneal fish pass. As you can see here, the water is turbulently coming through the middle. This was designed specifically for Atlantic, adult Atlantic salmon. And as you can see here, there's a piece of wood in the top. There's constant maintenance needed for these structures. The, the weir itself in high flows is sort of categorized by plunging turbulent flows in and around the fish pass, which makes fish passage difficult. Here we have an image looking downstream from the structure. As you can see here, it has, due to central location of the Deneal fish pass, it has a tendency to collect debris. And this will require consistent maintenance over the season as material gets captured in the Deneal fish pass, which is the preferred option for fish passage through the structure. As you can see here, the new, the, Anacotti Weir historically has not always looked as it does now. During the OPW arteria drainage scheme, the weir was modified and a dog leg was added. This is a, the OSI Cassini six inch map from 19, 1830 to 1930. So this map is probably drawn in about the 1920s. As you can see, the dog leg isn't visible on this structure. So at some point the weir was modified, that during, the, during drainage, the, the weir was modified and the central Deneal fish pass was added. So you can see here some, some older images of the mill as it was. So why are we so interested in barriers to fish passage why, of man-made structures in rivers? Well, at a, basic, at a basic point, what happens in these structures is that a large structure in a river, it turns the river from a, from a river into a lake in its most basic form. So what you do, what, what, so what's happening is that a lot of the physical habitats that the species have evolved to live in, in a river, are removed or interrupted or disturbed or just non-functional anymore. As you can see in a free-flowing river, you have dynamic flows, you have the transport of sediment, you have like riffle pool glide sequence, you have spawning habitat on the riffles, and you have a natural temperature regime and the free passage of aquatic organisms. In a dammed river, most of these processes are interrupted or disturbed. Some of the healthy substrate here can be buried under sediment because what's happening is that the dam or the weir has created a big slack pocket upstream, an impoundment effect upstream of the structure. And this causes sediment to settle out. And this sediment will then 
impact on the spawning substrate, and it will create a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of silty, a lot of large silty area which you can have lots of emergent vegetation starting to grow in. This is obviously causes uniform flows, and in a lot of cases can drastically change the species composition living upstream of a weir. So here we have in this diagram what you can see here is that you have a lot more coarse fish in these impounded sections because they're evolved to, to live in lakes, while our brown trout and salmon are more for a free flowing river in terms of riffle pool glide habitat. An important thing to note here is these dams and weirs, they can alter the temperature easy. So in a time of global climate change and you know, hotter summers and lower flows in these hot summers, you know, that can have a serious effect on the, on the populations in the river. And then you come down to just the passage of aquatic organisms. Can the fish actually get over the weir? And in Ireland, our native flora, such as Atlantic salmon, sea lamprey, eels, they've, they're all anadromous or protadromous species. So they need to migrate to and from the sea to complete their life cycles. And if there's a big structure in the river which prevents this, obviously it can have serious implications for their, the survival of the species. And then downstream of these weirs, what can, happen, what can happen is you have sediment starvation. So the dam will trap a lot of sediment upstream in terms of spawning habitat, spawning sediment and habitat. So it'll, all the large cobble and gravel will be trapped upstream of the structure and it won't progress downstream. So you'll have a, like a deficit of a spawning habitat downstream of some of these large structures. And in some of our studies that we've done, we found that the water temperature coming out of a river, out of an impounded section, can be several degrees warmer than the water going in. So in a very hot, low summer day, the area and the habitat downstream of a weir may be actually not available to some of our cold water species like trout, who have a, a sort of a thermal preference of about 16 degrees. So if that water temperature coming over the weir is 21 degrees, these fish won't actually want to be there. They'll actually leave the habitat. The habitat will become unavailable to them. So what are our drivers for change? We have some European directives we have, which have superseded some of our, our own legislation. We have the Water Framework Directive. And in it, it states that the continuity of a river is not disturbed. And we should allow the undisturbed migration of aquatic organisms and sediment transport. So that basically the sediment can move freely downstream. So it's not trapped behind weirs and culverts and bridges. And that the, the, the fish and the other invertebrates using the river or living in the river can move, migrate up and down stream freely. And one of the words that I'd like to put out here at the moment is hydromorphology. And that's a WFD, Water Framework Directive word. And it refers to both the water and the physical shape of the river, hydro, water, morphology, the, the shape of the river. And it's one of those critical components in the Water Framework Directive, because a lot of, you know, what happens is if the physical habitat of a river isn't there for the, fi for the fish or the plants or the other organisms that are using that river, you know, they won't be there. They need habitat, they need a place to live. And hydromorphology reflects that need of a place for these animals to live. So as I was saying earlier, if you turn your river into a lake, that's bad hydromorphology. You basically utter utterly change the way the river is flowing and how the water is flowing and the sediment is moving. So it's an important, thing to note, it'll be a big ticket in the future, and uh, there's going to be a lot of work around this. Other directives is the Habitats Directive, and we have under the Habitats Directive, we have an obligation to maintain or restore habitats for salmon, for shad, and lamprey. And everyone knows salmon. Shad are an anadromous herring that lives in the southeast, so down the Slaney, the Nord, the Barrow, and the Shore, and they need to get, they're impacted by weirs in their, in their habitats. And then lamprey, which we see in Anacotti, the yeah, large sea lamprey and river lamprey. And in terms of those species, both shad and lamprey are particularly poor swimmers and jumpers. So, you know, these structures, weirs and dams really do impact their, their, uh, their life cycles. And then we have the EU eel regulations. You know, eels need to migrate to the Sar Sargasso Sea. You know, so you can't, you know, when they come back as small little elvers, these, these species have to be able to make their way up over weirs. And then the EU biodiversity strategy for 2030. So across Europe, this strategy is looking to free up 25,000 kilometers of rivers 
and restore them into a free flowing state by 2030. So in Ireland, that's approximately, if we're divided up equally among all the European member states, we're talking about a thousand kilometers of river that we'll need to free up by 2030 to allow these species to naturally recruit and survive over, let's say, to add resilience to them and resistance to climate change and other impacts that we're, we're that humans and nature is bringing to their environment and their habitat. And it's a hot topic. Um, there's lots of material out there in terms of barrier mitigation and weir removal. And um, as you can see here, American rivers, dam removal Europe, World Fish Migration Day, the Amber Project, which is a pan-European project that IFI was involved in looking at how best to deal with these problems. And I think it sums up nicely here, this little cartoon in terms of uh, what we're trying to do. So a river runs through it, but the fish can't. So we look at a lot of these things in terms of our own perspective, but we have to think about these aquatic animals and how they can, how can, how, how can, how they use the catchments or the, the river and how we can help them. Because what we're putting there is artificial. And then as you can see here is World Fish Migration Day poster. A lot of these pressures are also applicable to let's say sea lamprey and Atlantic salmon. And again, barrier mitigation is hydromorphology. So it's one of our core components for the Water Framework Directive and achieving good, good status in years to come. So what's IFI doing about these things? Well, we have the National Barrier Programme and we are out there assessing structures since 2018. And as you can see here, there's a lot of work to do. Um, we have a barrier countdown. We've identified 73,000 potential barriers in the river network in Ireland. So these are culverts, road bridges, weirs, dams, you name it. If it crosses a river, it has the potential to impact on um, river hydromorphology, fish passage, uh, river form and function. So how are we doing since 2018? Well, we've surveyed possibly up to 26,000 potential barriers now. So we've, we're hard at it. You can see here on a map on the right, this is where we are. We're East Coast centric, mostly because of COVID, <laughs> because uh, it reduced our travel. And uh, as you can see here, we've surveyed most of the Barrow, a lot of the Shore, the Noor, and a lot of the Donegal rivers as well. And that's due to our collaboration with our regional colleagues in protection. So the, bad, the good news is, <clears throat> we have classified about approximately 20,000 structures as not a barrier. And the bad news is we found 6,000 plus structures that are potential barriers that have the potential to impact fish passage and hydromorphology. However, some of these are in headwater streams that have little impact, but like Anacati, some of them are low down in the river catchments and affect like hundreds of kilometers of river network upstream of them. So one of the things I say to understand a barrier, you must think like a fish. Again, not through human eyes, but try to see it as a fish would. And understand their limitations. Not every fish is like a salmon. Like a salmon are amazing jumpers, amazing leapers, like was it leak slip is my favorite example. It's the salmon jump. And like historically, that was a, a large waterfall before they built a dam on it. So we can't think like salmon. We can't think like able to jump two meters, no problems. We have to think like sea lamprey and shad and eels who are poor jumpers, who really struggle through high velocity water and any hydraulic drop at all in the river can really affect their passage. And these fish do need to get to the upper headwaters to spawn and they do need to complete their life cycles for them and for the WFD and Habitats Directive and for just, you know, general uh, for ecological purposes. So <clears throat> when does a structure become a barrier? It's surprisingly small in terms of lamprey and coarse fish and eels. So it starts to affect fish passage when the hydraulic head, the jump that the fish has to make to make passage is greater than 0.1 of a meter. 10 centimeters, so it's very small. At what point, so if the water depth is less than 0.1 of a meter, again, very, very small. And that's because an adult salmon, which is up to 20 pounds, needs quite a lot of water to swim through if he's going to make 
passage. So if you come across a bridge floor, which is very wide and very shallow, he physically can't swim through it because he just jump onto it and he'd fall over and he'd be washed off. So, and then again, if the effective length of the structure is greater than 10 meters. Some of these fish species do not have the capacity to maintain extensive burst swimming for a long time. So to swim fast and hard for over 10 meters might be too much for some of these coarse fish, especially shad. So where they just get too tired and then they get washed off the structure. So in terms of, you know, these structures can be very small, but can be very impactful. So a definition of a weir, so it's regulating flow conditions and water levels, intercepting sediment or stabilizing river, the riverbed, and are generally less than five meters in height. So if we look at the three images I have here, this is a historic uh, mill on the barrow. This is a, a gauging station on the Kells Blackwater or a trip of the Kells Blackwater. And this is a, a sediment trap upstream on, I think on the, the Brosna. And each of them impacts fish passage. As you can see here from this video, <coughs> this structure is impacting fish passage because of the fast, narrow uh, laminar flow over the face of the weir, the lack of a plunge pool, and the turbulence down here. And you know, people say they like watching salmon jump at a weir. I actually find it quite emotionally traumatic because the fish is there because we put a structure in it with no mindfulness for, to them. And they're wasting all this energy to try to get over it, to get to, to complete their life cycle. Because, you know, because we, were, we weren't thoughtful enough to, to improve their fish passage or to improve their passage. So it's quite, I find it quite difficult to watch because some of these species, I have actually found salmon that have exhausted themselves and, and uh, expired or passed away, died from trying to pass, pass a weir. So, and some of the other stuff that we have to be mindful of. <coughs> Are there any problems here from fish? From fish. This is an historic pool fish pass built on the Kells Blackwater, for, specifically for Atlantic salmon. And as you can see, there's sort of high velocity, high turbulence. There's a, a broken piece in here where there's very, the pool doesn't extend right in under, the, under the, the gap for the fish to swim through. And if you were an Atlantic salmon, you probably would make fish pa make passage here. You'd probably be able to swim up through these pools. But if you were a salmon smolt looking to redistribute through the, through the river, you probably wouldn't. There's too much, you know, too much turbulence here and too much high velocity. And if you were one of these species, like a coarse fish or a sea lamprey or an eel, you wouldn't make passage through that because there's too much turbulence and there's too much of a high velocity. And again, this is a nice quote from Bernie Gavin et al. in 2019, that most of the fish passes you see in this country, in Ireland especially, were designed specifically for adult Atlantic salmon and actually don't facilitate passage for other species or even juvenile Atlantic salmon. So there's a lot of work for us to do in terms of trying to make these structures possible for everybody. And under the WFD and the Habitats Directive, we, we, it behooves us to do this. We need to make these structures possible for everyone, not just Atlantic salmon. So how do we assess these structures? That's what part of my task in the National Barrier Program is to go out and actually look at these structures and assess them in terms of their risk and then try to put them in some sort of prioritization order in terms of which ones should we go at first? Because obviously there's only a limited pool of money to mitigate these structures. And in terms of prioritization, that's where Anacati comes in because it's low down on the catchment. As you can see, as I showed you on the map, there's very few other weirs in the catchment that are a problem. And in, in investing energy and money and time into mitigating Anacati would open up a large swathe of that catchment, some of which is very good spawning a nursery habitat for Atlantic salmon. So it's got a big, big reward cost benefit for us so, so for, like, for doing Anacati. So how do we assess them? Well, we go out and we apply a sniffer, sniffer assessment. It's the WFD 111 barrier assessment. And in doing that, we look for how many different ways a fish could actually make passage over the structure. If you look at Anacati, I'll show you some slides later, there's three different ways a fish can make passage. And then we investigate uh, some criteria. We look at water velocities, depth of water, the obstacle height, and the presence and absence of a plunge pool, which is very 
very important. And then the flow type, is it plunging? Is there uh, turbulent flows and a, the hydraulic jump? You know, what are the, what are the, what, how does the structure physically present itself to fish passage in terms of what parts of that affect passage? So two examples here, this is a slot fish pass on a weir on the barrow, high velocity water, quite turbulent below it, little shallow too. So it might be difficult for a large Atlantic salmon to pass through that. This is a fish pass on down in Kerry, on the Ovan. Again, there's actually large drops between the fish boxes in terms of each, each box fish pass. It's a box fish pass. So it, between the boxes, there's actually quite a big drop. And again, as an Atlantic salmon, you'd be okay. But if you were a smaller brown trout or a sea lamprey, this would not be appropriate for, the, for your passage. So looking at the Anacotti weir, Here's a drone image on the right. We can identify three potential fish passage, passage routes. TS1, 2, and 3. TS1 is the face of the weir, the actual face of the weir. Could a fish pass up the face of the weir in an average flow day? And probably they couldn't because the depth of water is less than 0 0.03 of a meter and it's quite high velocity. So that's a complete barrier to all swimming fish. So in a normal low flow day, Fish can't swim over the face of the weir. On TS2, which is the lamprey tiles, now sort of damaged, uh, the depth of water at the foot of the weir, and there's high velocities there. So where the lamprey tiles are broken, uh, there's the water depth is less than 0.4, and the velocities are greater than 0.25. And that represents a complete barrier again to all the swimming fish. So in terms of too much water, too, too high velocity, the slope of the weir is too great, and the, the depth of water isn't enough for the fish to swim through. And then finally, looking at the Daniel fish pass, this was before the, the, the baffles were attempted to be repaired. Um, there's a large number, there's a high level of turbulence downstream of the structure. There's high velocities in, in the, this pass in, right in here. It's greater than 1.5 meters a second. So it's very high velocity through here. Uh, and this rep represents a high impact partial barrier to adult salmon. So even for adult salmon, the velocity through the structure, the high turbulence, the standing wave would all impact on the fish passage. So only you applying the sniffer model, only a third of the salmon presenting at this weir will make passage. And it's a complete barrier to juvenile salmon on adult lamprey. So adult lamprey won't be able to swim up through that structure because there's too much turbulence and the standing wave is great and the velocity is too high.